Amen. Well, we are in chapter 2 of John Steele. Amen. Amen. And uh, I'm going to read verses 3 through 6. Is everybody having a good week? Amen. How did you like the blizzard? <laughs> we made it through the blizzard. I'm so, so, so proud of us Texans. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the snow. I never saw it. I did have a friend posted a snowflake on her deck. She said she got it before it melted. I was privileged to see that snowflake. Yes. Christmas is on the way, people. It's known. All right. Uh, chapter 2 of 1 John, <coughs> verses 3 through 6. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk, just as he walked. So I'm going to start off tonight uh, talking about walking in the right direction. <clears throat> and uh, last week we ended up, I was telling you, we, we make serving God um, almost like checking off bullet points on a list. And this is not what God intended. God did not so much give us directions as a direction. He said walk in the light. That is the direction that we're supposed to be walking. Amen? And remember I told you last week that if we just make it a set of bullet points that we're taking off, we, we cease having that relationship with God that he wants us to have. So I want to talk a little bit tomorrow, tonight about walking in the light. Um, why are rules given? Let, let's say in school. There are rules when you go to school. Huh? To protect us. To protect us. Order. To keep order. Anybody else? Is it not to guide our behavior? Amen? We need some guidelines. And that's what God's word is. It's a set of guidelines. But it is not... Um, to be used as, like I said, that I want to keep that bullet point is what I keep coming to my mind because so many people think that as long as they check off that list, then everything is right. But it is supposed to be a guideline because remember last week I told you, is there heat on up here? Yeah. <laughs> it is hot. Very, very hot. If you could get me some air up here, I would really, truly appreciate it. <clears throat> Is everybody else hot in here? Yeah. I can't breathe. I'm so hot. All right. <laughs> Whoever's cold, I love you. Amen. Um, anyway, going back to a guideline of behavior, any of you uh, raising your children, do they have duties that they are responsible for at home? Maybe to clean up their room or take out the trash? <clears throat> Let's take that said child that has been told to clean up their room. And, um, and they do. They go in there. There may be a lot of harping to get it done, but they get in there and they clean their room. But then they come out of their room and they walk through the living room where toys are scattered and shoes are flung and there's blankets where they've been curled up. And they walk through the kitchen where they put their, their plate and their glass and their leftover food and the wrappers from the snacks and they go to their bathroom and take a shower and the towels and the dirty clothes and the wet stuff and the toothpaste is in the sink and splattered on the mirror. Amen? Yeah. Okay, now, mom and dad gave them the rule that you're responsible for your bedroom. But is this the only thing that they're supposed to do? But that's what they've been told. Clean their room, and they clean their room. But it is not, isn't it to teach them responsibility?
responsibility. You keep your room clean because that's how we want the house. And this is your area. And I'm teaching you and I'm training you how to be responsible with things in the house. But if they clean their room and walk through the mess in the living room and through the mess in the kitchen and through the mess in the bathroom, then that's kind of defeating the whole purpose of having the rule about cleaning your bedroom. Am I right? Okay. So this is what I'm talking about when it comes to the commandments that God has given and the guidelines that he has given in his word, the do this and the don't do that. It is not an exclusive itemed list, but it is a set of guidelines teaching us right behavior so that when we are faced with something that may not be a bullet point on the list in God's word, we have learned the right behavior, and therefore we know what to do and not to do in instances that are not directly mentioned in the word of God. Amen? So this is how God intends us to work with his word. This is our guidebook. And yes, there are some to-dos and not to-dos, and we discussed that last week, that it is not just to inhibit us or keep us from having fun, but those things are in place because God knows what is beneficial to us and what will harm us. Amen? So there's a lot of different reasons that we have guidelines in the Word of God. But the main thing is I want to keep pressing home relationship. Remember, I ended last week holding this up and saying, this whole book is about relationship, our relationship with God. That's why we were created. So when we're talking about walking in the right direction, we need to ask ourselves, what does, because he was talking about knowing God, so what does knowing God look like in our lives? How does knowing God express itself in your life? Let's go back to that child. Our kids know that we have expectations, certain expectations of them, right? And if that child loves their parents, then it makes them happy to fulfill those expectations of their parents, and it makes them sad when they fail in doing that. Um, have you ever had your child fail in the expectations that you had of them? Did you ever fail your parents in their expectations of you? Were you glib and happy about that? Or did it break your heart when you saw your mom or your dad and you saw the sorrow on their face, when you knew that you had disappointed them, when you knew that you had failed them, when you had come way short of the standard and expectations that they had for you, this is how it is with God. When we fall short of the standard that God has set up for us, it makes him sad. But it does not make him a wrathful, vengeful, angry God at you. And, and I think that this is where we cross over with the parent and child thing and kind of get it messed up a little bit because when our kids fail in something that they've been expected to do time and time again, we get a little wrathful and angry. And do we not? Yeah. And the belt comes out. And it is applied to the place where they sit down, you know, and, and we're upset and we're angry and we don't understand why they just can't do what they're supposed to do. They know what's expected of them. Why can't they just do it? But then let's look at us. Our Father in Heaven has expectations of us. And when we fail Him time after time after time, what if He got angry and wrathful with us. Amen? He does correct us and there are times that it hurts when he corrects us. Amen? 
but he does everything out of love. And that's what the church needs to remember. And that's what we as parents, let me just throw this in there. That's what we need to remember. Amen. That when we're correcting our child, that it is for their benefit to train them, train them in behavior and what is right and wrong. And it shouldn't be done in anger. Have you ever spanked your kid in anger? Did you feel bad about it afterwards? Did you go back and apologize and said, I should have spanked you then. I should have gone and cooled off. We all do that, amen? Let's try to stop that. I just threw that in. It has nothing to do with the lesson, but it sounded good, amen? All right. So, in here it says that if we claim to know him and we don't keep his commandments, that we're a liar. Now, John didn't mess around and say you're being a little less than truthful or you might really need to rethink things because it's not lining up. He just came out and said you're a liar. Right? And I think sometimes, let me just throw this in there. So many times in the kingdom of God, we try to make things um, um, easy to take. But the word of God is for correction, and it's for rebuke, it's for reproof. And it all should be done in love, not in anger, not to get back at somebody, not because whatever. It should be done in love, but we need to quit backing away from it because we're afraid to offend somebody. We need to quit walking around it because we don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. But we just need to do what the Word of God says and handle business. Amen? Because when you don't, it's just like the parent that doesn't want to correct the child and doesn't correct the child and the child misbehaves and the child doesn't get corrected and the behavior of the child gets what? Worse and worse and worse because there is no correct. What is correction? It's correcting the behavior. Amen? So if there is no correcting of the behavior, the child's going to get worse and worse. If we as the body of Christ are not willing to correct and not willing to be corrected. There's not a single one of us sitting in here that at times do not need to be corrected in our behavior. Albeit done in love, still there needs to be some lining up of correct behavior. If we allow people to go on in wrong behavior in their Christian spiritual walk, then we are just enabling them to live a less than life in God. I know... Um, the other night uh, at prayer meeting, there was a situation going on in prayer, and we had someone stop and take the time to minister to someone in the correct way to handle this in the spiritual realm. And it wasn't to get on to them. It was to help them to know how to deal with the situation that they were facing. But a lot of times it's easier and um, on us to let it go. Because it takes time to pour into somebody's life. It, it takes time to sit down with someone and explain to them what era is about. If we say that we love God, but we don't keep his commandments, we're liars. But I want to go a little bit further with this. And if we are the church that's allowing people to break the commandments of God without bringing correction to the situation, without bringing, a lot of times it's just simply a matter of bringing knowledge. He says walk in the light. The direction that we're going is walking in the light. What does light do? It dispels darkness. It brings um, knowledge that was hidden to light. Amen? So a lot of times correcting behavior spiritually is just a matter of giving forth some knowledge. Because uh, a new baby Christian may have um, a wrong thought process. Or they may just be doing whatever they, they can because they don't know what to do. So they just dive in trying to do it. And there needs to be elder men and women in the body of Christ that are spiritual enough to walk up and give a helping hand. Amen? Amen. All right. So... Um, I wanted to read this. Remember the two circles that we had, the circle of light 
in the circle of darkness. We choose to live in one circle or the other. Remember we talked last, last week and I told you, you don't have the option of creating your own circle. There are two circles, circle of light, circle of darkness. And I wrote this down. We choose to live in one of those circles or the other. It is the realm in which our decisions, our choices, our behavior, and our character are shaped. Which circle have you chosen to live in? Whichever circle that you've chosen to live in, that is what is shaping you. That is what is shaping your life. If you've chosen to live in the circle of light, then it is God's character that is shaping you and shaping you to be like Him, His righteousness, His love. Amen? If you've chosen the circle of darkness, then evil is shaping who you are. Whether you want to admit it or not, there's one or not. Who is shaping your behavior? Who is determining your character? If we say that we know God, if we say that we love God, yet I keep not his commandments, but I'm over here in this other circle keeping these commandments, then I'm a liar. I cannot live in one and the other at the same time. Um, the scriptures are given to teach us, right? To shine light, to give us knowledge. And I wrote down here that our lives are lived walking in the light to train us. The scriptures are given to teach us. Walking in the light is given to train us. Amen? I, I want to go back and read verse uh, 5. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. We do not become perfect the moment we get saved, right? But as we walk in the life, in the light, our life is perfected as light is shown into the dark places of our life and we gain knowledge through his word, through being taught his word, we are being taught the character of God, but it is in our daily walk in that light being shown on it that we are perfected. This is the training period. And so many times we get aggravated with new Christians because maybe they don't live up to par to our standards. And what if you've been serving God for 50 years and the new Christian has been serving God three years? You're wanting them to already know all the light that has been shown in your life for 50 years in three years' time? They are in training just like you were. They're walking in the light as they see it just as you are. We don't know everything at the moment that we get saved, right? It is a continual process of being perfected. I don't care how many times you read the Word of God. You've heard this said. I don't care how many times that you hear a portion of Scripture or a story in the Word of God taught or preached. Every time you hear it, you're going to hear something different. You're going to learn something different. A new layer is going to come off of it. A new meaning is going to come out of it. The, love of the, the Word of God is alive and living, powerful. The love of God in our life it's alive. It's moving. It's powerful. It is not a stagnant thing, but we are constantly growing in Christ. That is walking in the light. That is being in training. And there are, there are different areas in the Word of God, and we'll get into that the next week so I can. I'm, I'm fixing to get ahead of myself. But we are in training. I'll just stick with that. Daily examinations. Um... What did Paul say? I examine myself what? Daily. Now, did God tell us to examine ourselves daily? No. Paul said that. But are there numerous scriptures throughout the word of God that tell us in so many words that we need to do just exactly that? 
We constantly need to be looking at our hearts and the thought processes that go through our mind. Every day, God does not want you um, stressing and, and having myopic vision on every moment of your life. I'm fixing to drive. I'm fixing. I hate that. I'm about to drive up to Dairy Queen to the window. Will I be nice to the girl behind the window? I must be nice. Check myself. Keep temper in check. Be smiling. Be happy. Show the love of Christ at all times, Suzanne. And, and I'm going to stress myself out to make sure that I'm a pleasing child of God and shining the light wherever I am. I'll go crazy. If every moment of the day I am trying to examine myself in every point, amen? It's impossible. But at some point during the day, the Holy Spirit is going to say, you were less than nice at this moment. You snapped at this moment. And you're going to know that you're walking in the light had some um, glitches this day. Amen? It does not mean, again, that we get cast out of the circle. It just means, once again, that our Father wraps his arms around us and says, let's look at this area. What could we have done to be a little bit nicer here, you know? What could we have done not to have made such a, a drama fest? Um, Facebook is full of drama. And, and so many times I just want to say, put it back in the drawer at your house. It doesn't need to be out there on Facebook, you know? If you need prayer, contact some brothers or sisters and say, I need prayer. But don't put your dirty laundry on Facebook. It's not the place. And church sometimes can be full of drama. My granddaughter gets in the car every day after school, and I hear drama. I'm so tired of drama, you know? I mean, there are some things that happen in our life that we have to deal with, but then there are some things that we bring to our plate, and we eat it up. Amen? You don't have to know everybody's business on Facebook. Scroll, people. Scroll. Cute baby. Precious. <laughs> Scroll, you know. But don't get sucked in with drama. Amen? We need to reflect on what we say and do during the day. We need to reflect on how we've spent our time during the day. You know, the great suckers of time. The phone. The computer. The iPad. The TV, you know, there are great time suckers in our life. What have we done with our day? How have we spent our time? Amen? And you may think that that's silly, but how many times have you said, I just don't have time to read God's Word like I need to, but you sit on Facebook for two hours? Amen. Oh, holler. Amen? Yes, I didn't say holler. All right. Some people have peace about them. Have you ever been around somebody that they are at complete peace with their relationship with God? Do you know why that is? Because they know who they are in God. They've learned to take things to God in prayer. They, they are assured of God's love and acceptance of them. They don't go begging God for things. Amen? Um, they have learned that God is their foundation in time of trouble and discouragement. And they have learned that God is there for them, that God loves them. And they know that God loves them, and they love God, and that's all they need. They are in complete peace because whatever comes my way, I know that my God is faithful. Amen? And he's going to take care of things for me. And there may be a lot of stuff happening in my life, but I love God, and I know God loves me, and I know he's faithful to his children, so I'm just going to rest in that. I'm just going to stay at peace within myself. Then there are others that 
seem like they're constantly um, plagued by doubt and confusion, confusion, <laughs> Confucius say, confusion in their lives. And I wrote this, those are the ones who chase desperately for feelings of assurance in their walk in Christ. And most of the time they don't find it. Because we don't have to chase, we don't have to chase assurance in our life in Christ, in our faith in Christ. God has given us the assurance that he loves us. And again, like I told you, he loved us so much, he sent his son to die. What more proof do you need? That is your assurance that God loves you. So stay at peace. Quit, quit being in confusion and doubt and, and begging God to show you and, and, and worrying about your relationship with God. If you love God and you've kept his commandments, you're good. Amen? If you failed in his commandments and asked forgiven, you're good. Because you're walking in the light. And as the Holy Spirit reveals things to us you should have done, you shouldn't have done, then we line ourselves up because we're in training. Amen? Amen? This life is training ground. Abiding in Christ. Um... Oh, let me say this, too. I, I just saw this. Talking back in those, those two circles again, um, there is a center point in that circle. You know, we talked about before a circle is made from the center point. There's a focal point that a circle is made from, right? If we concentrate on our feelings, whether it's confusion or doubt or whatever, we're going to become disoriented inside that circle. But if we focus on the center of the circle, which is God, then everything else is going to orientate itself around that point. Everything in our lives will be drawn around that one center point if that becomes your focus. But see, that's the question that we need to answer. Who is the focal point? Is it God? Is it you? Is it your children? Is it the church? What is your focal point? The church can't be your focal point. Uh, working in ministry under your pastor can't be your focal point. God has to be the focal point and the center point of all things. Amen? Okay, by abiding in Christ. The word abide comes from the Greek word meno. And it means to stay in a place, to remain, to continue to be present, to be kept continually, to endure or last, to adhere to, to wait for or await, that's what abide means. When it comes to our relationship with God, it's a little bit more because God's relationship with us is alive and moving and working every day. So it, the connotation in this scripture means a little bit more than just to stay in a place, amen? To dwell in a place because the relationship that we have with God is ever moving, is ever changing, is ever growing, is ever learning. It's living, it's moving, it is not stagnant and stays in one, one place. So the abide here doesn't really do the word meno justice. Um, and I looked it up in another place and it says, to be continually operative in him by his divine influence. Now I like that. Let me read that again. To abide means to be continually operative in him, operating in him by his divine influence. So if he's influencing us during the day in this walk in the light as we're doing, then we need to be influenced by walk this way. You know, don't just stay in the church. When, when he says abide in me, it means if, if he's our dwelling place, then where he goes, we have to go. What he does, we have to do. Amen? That's more the, the meaning of what it has there. And I wanted to, one of my favorite uh, chapters is John chapter 15, where it's talking about the vine and the branches. And I wanted to read, um, let me find it, 15 and 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. 
And this gives us um, a little bit clearer definition because spiritually, if I'm abiding in Christ, I can't do anything unless I'm there, grafted into that vine. Everything that I do will be unproductive unless I'm abiding in him and he's abiding in me. Unless we're a, a working entity that is togetherness, that, that unity, that whatever he does, I do. Whatever he says, I say. Wherever he goes, I go. This is that meaning. It's that shifting, abiding and dwelling that I'm with him. I'm not just staying in the world. I'm not just being faithful to church, but I'm ever moving, ever growing. It is a, do you get the sense of that? It is a living entity. A relationship with God is living and powerful. It's energizing. Amen? And if your walk with Christ is stale and stagnant, it's because you're not abiding. You're not, you're not dwelling in whatever place he's in. Amen? God's just not going to dwell in your prayer closet at your house. And when you want to see God, then I'll go into my prayer closet and this is where I abide with him. That's not what it means. It means every day, every moment that my life is in him. His life is in me. Amen? All right. Let's go on. Um, oh, 1 Peter 1 and 16. It says, Be ye holy. For I am holy. And to be is a, in an imperative form here. It's a commandment. Now, um, I, I wanted to read an article, um, an excerpt from an article by Joel Scandrick. Um, I, I thought this was a really good um, clarifying article on to be holy because... We know that to be holy means to, to be set apart, to be sanctified unto God. But we concentrate, let, let me read this. To be holy is talking about more than moral purity or doing good. And this is what we condense being holy into, okay? So it's more than just moral purity or doing good. It means much more. The basic meaning of the word is to be set apart or dedicated to God, to belong to God. God said, I will be your God and you will be my people. Biblical holiness describes a unique relationship that God has established with his people. Remember, he's the keeper of the covenant. He established this. Before, now listen to this. Before we are ever called to be good, we are called to be holy. Did y'all catch that? Before we're ever called to be good, we're called to be holy. Um, when we, uh, we have to be careful not to fall into the trap of reducing holiness to mere moral issues. When we respond in faith to the revelation of God in His Son, Jesus Christ, we become united with Christ. To be a Christian means far more than merely to believe in God because the word of God says that even the demons believe. Amen? So you have to have more than just believing in God. It means to be united with Jesus in and through the Holy Spirit. Galatians 2 and 20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I have been crucified with Christ. Why was Christ crucified? For our sins. So if I have been crucified with Christ, I have crucified, I have killed the sin that was ever present in my life. Amen? And he says, it's no longer me that's living in this vessel. But Christ is now living. Why? Because he abides in me and I abide in him. Colossians 3 and 3, Paul tells us that our lives are hidden with Christ in God. What a beautiful, beautiful thought. My life is hidden with Christ in God. 
Have you ever felt like, I, I just want to go and hide away? You can. How many times does the psalmist tell us, God, hide me in, the, in your pavilion? Amen? Bring me into that sheltered place. Because there are some times that the storms in our life get so great that we just need to hide away again. This scripture says, we are hidden away with Christ in God. You have that place. You know, they always say, go to your happy place. There's your happy place. You are hidden with Christ in God. Ephesians 2 and 6 says this, that we have been seated with God in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. This is not talking about after the rapture takes a place. We have been seated with God in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus today, present tense. We are there now. We have the right to approach the throne room of God with boldness, amen? Not with arrogance, but with the boldness of a child that knows this is my father and he loves me, amen? And continuing on with this excerpt because I kind of got off there. Because of our union with Christ, we are able to participate in the life of God. He dwells in us and we dwell in Him. As long as our notions of holiness are limited to doing certain things and not doing certain things, is that not how we were taught that holiness is? We can go through our entire lives obeying the rules or at least maintaining the appearance of doing so, without dealing with far more fundamental questions, such as to whom do we give our first love and loyalty. If we are so concerned about living our entire lives, obeying the rules and the laws, we are missing out on a fantastic, living, powerful, energizing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what it means to abide in him. That's how our lives are perfected. The love of Christ is perfected in us through living out his word. Amen? It's through that training process, walking in the light. It all goes together. Amen? God's call to be holy is a radical, all-encompassing claim on our lives and our identities. And this call is an ongoing and continual process that will continue in our lives until we are called home. Amen. His love is continually being perfected in us through his word as we walk in the light. Amen? Amen. What time is it? I did good tonight. <laughs> I finished right on time. Would you stand? <laughs> Father, we thank you for your perfecting love in us. Father, I thank you that we have the right and the privilege to walk in the direction that you have pointed us. And that's walking in the light as the Holy Spirit shines on us, revelation, knowledge, wisdom. God, help us always to have an attentive ear. That we would never be accused of being liars, of saying that we love you, but not keeping your commandments. Father, help us to be obedient children and realize that these rules are given to guide us to help build the character of God with inside of us. Lord, help us to stay in that light, that darkness would be dispelled, and we give you all praise and honor in the name of Jesus. And the church says, Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.